The Yuuzhan Vong War saw the death of the New Republic and the birth of the Galactic Alliance, a government which attempted to unify the New Republic, the Empire, and other independent factions including the Jedi Order. However, while long lived, at least in post-Republic terms, by 170 years after the Battle of Yavin, the Empire had fully withdrawn from the Alliance and declared war. After siding with the Sith, and specifically the one true Sith led by Darth Krayt, the war turned in the Empire's favor and the Alliance was pushed into exile. However, a mere three years later, Darth Krayt attempted an assassination on Rhone Fell and seized control of the Empire and the galaxy, both of which he heavily militarized. The Imperial fleet under his control would create the ultimate Star Destroyer, the Imperius. We'll talk about that ship today, but before we do, let's talk about its predecessor, the Pelion, and the Legacy Era. So there were two major doctrinal shifts in naval strategy between the early Galactic Alliance era and the Legacy Era. First, the military became less decentralized, with the Galactic Alliance itself providing most of the military force throughout the galaxy rather than individual systems. This is what I'd call an Imperial model compared to a Republic or a New Republic model. Second, there was a rejection of large capital ships, with a focus on specialization and efficiency rather than size. For that reason, although actually smaller than an Imperial Star Destroyer, arguably the most powerful warship in the galaxy, at least until its successor, was the Pelion Star Destroyer. The Pelion was intended to maintain the classic Imperial Star Destroyer design while making substantial design improvements, not unlike its namesake, Admiral Galad Pelion. The Pelion's hull was slanted forward, optimizing the ship for forward attacks, while also optimizing the firing arcs for individual guns. Because the guns could rotate freely, many were actually centralized on the ship's spine, however for broadsides only, some were placed within the ship's brim, with secondary guns also dotting the entirety of the vessel. The Pelion also had a very small side profile, and thus was a deadly force when broadsiding an enemy. It could bring all of the firepower of an Imperial Star Destroyer to bear, but was harder to hit. On that note, the ship did have the standard elevated Star Destroyer bridge, but it was closer to the ship's body where it could be protected by its guns. Also from a design standpoint, the front of the Pelion is also very similar to the Resurgent, although they exist in different continuities, in that both seem to have a variety of sensors and communication equipment near the front of the ship. Legacy era ships were so small, partially due to miniaturization of computer technology, but the Pelion itself was seen as a command ship, so extensive facilities would have been needed for communication, fleet coordination, and more. Although we don't know much more regarding hard numbers, as I said, the Pelion was smaller than a Star Destroyer, it probably had a comparable carrying capacity, and most likely actually outgunned an ISD due to differences in technology. It also had built-in interdiction capabilities, which is incredibly impressive, and large capital ships of the Legacy Era also had much faster hyperdrives, with the Pelion rocking a .75. For these reasons, it's pretty clear why the ship was considered essentially a miniaturized SSD, meant especially for command duties and capable of destroying pretty much any enemy capital ship in a one-on-one -on -one battle. Pelions were commonly found anchoring major fleets across the galaxy, and were produced in numbers. However, as the Legacy Era campaign guide explains, though the Pelion was an appropriately effective command ship, Darth Krayt turned to the Mon Calamari to upgrade the design, and in traditional Mon Cal fashion, they made something already good even better. First of all, the new ship, which would be called the Imperius, boasted even better internal computer systems, while components of all types took up less space. On that note, despite being actually a little bit larger, crew requirements were massively decreased in a trend seen almost two centuries earlier with the Republic's Katana fleet. Because internal components took up much less space, I'm also guessing that the ship had a more robust internal structure. The shielding systems were also upgraded, making the devastating ship even harder to kill. Weaponry seemed to be essentially the same based on the RPG numbers we get, however, the Imperius was also outfitted with gravity mine technology. 
The New Republic arguably pioneered this type of mobile gravity-based technology with both their usage of interdiction mines and HIMS generators, but gravity mines are a really interesting idea. A ship could layer the battlefield with these mines, which would prevent hyperspace retreat. Additionally, the Fell Empire had a variety which could attach to enemy ships. Gravity mines come with both some advantages and disadvantages. One of the main advantages is that the capital ship doesn't actually need to be present to interdict a location. For example, mines can be dropped off on a hyperspace route and can function without any sort of oversight. This tactic was used incredibly successfully by both the Vong and the New Republic during their war. Also, when it comes to ship-based interdictors, it is possible to either destroy the ship or just escape its range, something that's more difficult with mines. However, there are also disadvantages. At least during the New Republic era, it was not possible to disengage a gravity mine, so once they were laid, both forces were stuck for a predetermined period of time, so it's sort of an all-in on the battle. They're also impossible to move after being laid. That's assuming at least that by the Legacy Era, no major technological improvements have been made. It's unclear whether the Imperius still had traditional interdiction technology, but I think it's very possible that those capabilities were neglected so more power could be shunted towards key systems. All in all though, the Imperius was unquestionably the most powerful ship of the Legacy Era, and in my mind, with some small issues, pretty much the greatest that a Star Destroyer can be, at least in its role as a command ship. The first Imperius was produced at the Mon Calamari shipyards, but was stolen as construction was finished. The Mon Calamari, who aided the Alliance in this theft, were rewarded by having their world utterly devastated by the Sith and the majority of Mon Calamari and Quarren on the planet killed. The Imperius, renamed the Alliance, would then serve as the GA's flagship for the remainder of the war. And that takes us to the end of today's video. What do you think of the Imperius? Is it a worthy successor of the Pelion and the Imperial Star Destroyer? Do you prefer something like the Nebula or other New Republic slash GA designs? Let me know all of that and more down in the comments. Also, is there anything else about the Legacy Era you'd like to learn? Feel free to also let me know that down below. Before we leave, however, I do have a Hashtag ask ek question of the day. This one comes from Brayden Potts, who asks, Out of curiosity, what would you do if Lucasfilm actually did offer to hire you? First of all, I don't think I have any sort of the skills that Lucasfilm is working for. There are people who know Star Wars lore as well as I do, and much, much better, certainly when it comes to canon, and who have other nice skills that they would bring in. But in some weird situation where they do think that I'm a good candidate for a job, it would really depend. I don't think I'd be willing to give up this YouTube channel for anything, so I would be really hard pressed to accept any sort of job that required me to do so. Also, I don't know if I want to live in America, I really love Canada and the city I live in now, so I'd want a job where I could work remotely. So I think both of those things take the already minuscule chance of being hired and make it, well, pretty much zero. Plus of course there's the fact that I've openly ripped on Marvel Comics and called out their shit in the past. Additionally too, and I'm just being honest, make this video a little bit longer, I'll answer a question from Noah Claridge. He asks, I was wondering, what about flying cars people used on Coruscant? I don't think they're all cloud cars, but what else could they be? That's a good question, and one you won't really understand unless you dig into the Star Wars EU. Star Wars has what's called repulsor lift vehicles. Basically, they operate on some sort of gravity manipulating system called repulsors. Typically, they don't actually fly in space. They're sort of what you'd call aircraft in the real world. Cloud cars would be another example of this, as would the Rebel Alliance's snow speeders. They're basically ships that can fly in atmosphere but not in space, and they use Star Wars's version of anti-grav technology. Repulsor lift vehicles were sometimes subject to jamming, harsh conditions like wind, or just general unreliability, so sometimes we also see vehicles like the Juggernaut, which use wheels, or AT-ATs or other walkers, which use legs, instead. And it also seems like certain repulsors, like Luke's speeder, were generally limited in how high they could travel. So I hope that answers your question. If anyone else has one they'd like me to answer at the end of the video, they can leave it down below with the hashtag AskGeck. But that's all I have for you guys today. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe, like, and turn notifications on. But until I see you next time, have a great day, and may the Force be with you.